Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt and we now turn to the final three poems of the inscription section at the beginning of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We are now at poem number 22 of that inscriptions chapter or the section of poets to come and really in some ways this is a fascinating text for us to study because it is one of the more anthologized of all of the poems of Leaves of Grass. I think there's a a lot of reasons for that that we'll get into. Go ahead and put this in your notes though right away. These last three poems are some of the more intimate poems that Whitman will share in Leaves of Grass. It's quite a remarkable thing at the end of inscriptions. I like to think of Whitman as Tiresias. Now, of course, Tiresias is that figure from our uh, you know, study of, of Homer and the, and the great Greek uh, tr uh, tradition. He's the prophet. And in some ways in this poem, we're going to see something very, very akin to some of that. Now, let's go to work really quickly with some of the assumptions, as we always do at the beginning of all of our lectures here, as we work through all of the poems of Leaves of Grass. LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, finding again that playlist that we call Talks with Walt. My assumption is that you've been engaging in earlier, previous lectures. Uh, uh, why? Because we are the stories that we tell and retell. We're also the stories we decide to accept and reject. And here, of course, Whitman is longing, as we have said in previous lectures, longing for some kind of acceptance. Those libraries that he hopes will somehow allow him and his book to appear on their shelves. Of course, we assume our learning theory of that uh, desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. The new is the new, the K and uh, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W, as we've said many times. Our annotative approach at level one, what does the text say at level two, what does it mean at level three, how can I relate to it? Our big five, the epistemological concerns, the ontological concerns, the psychological and sociological concerns, and then finally the question of theodicy. Why is it that bad things have to happen? Our five perspectives on Whitman are also assumed here. Whitman is poet, Whitman as person, Whitman as pedagogue or instructor, and here we're going to get some of that. Whitman as politician, his love of democracy, and of course Whitman as philosopher. Now let's go quickly as we've done in our prior lectures to a little bit of background information to just make sure that we're familiar with when we take a look at this poem, how exactly it is that um, we place it in the order of all the other writing that Whitman did. Now, in Poets to Come, this one was originally actually poem number 14 of Chance Democratic, um, and then in, uh, of uh, Leaves of Grass, the 1860. This poem was shortened and improved in 1867, transferred to the Answerer Group in 1871 and 1876, and then finally to the Inscriptions in 1881. In other words, this poem made the rounds. And as we've said about Whitman before, he loved to, add a, to edit his work, and so this poem went through some editing as well. Poets to come. Poets to come. Orators, singers, musicians to come. Not today is to justify me and answer what I am for, but you, a new breed, native, athletic, continental, greater than before known, arouse for you must justify me. I myself but write one or two indicative words for the future. I but advance a moment only to wheel and hurry back in the darkness. I am a man who, sauntering along without fully stopping, turns a casual glance, a casual look upon you, and then averts his face, leaving it to you to prove and define it, expecting the main things from you. Now, the fact that I even misspoke the word look after casual and I said glance, I think there's a reason for that because to me, this is one of the great, what I'm going to call in my lectures, glance poems. We see a number of these in Leaves of Grass, but this may be one of the most personal, one of the most dramatic in some ways. Let's go through now and annotate this poem, the ways in which Whitman is glancing. He's glancing to the future, and he always seemed to have, obviously our series of lectures here is proving his point, he always seemed to have this firm conviction that he would be more read in 200 years than he was in his own lifetime. And obviously it's, it's happened, right? It's happened. Notice we will begin, first of all, with the word poets. Now, here, put it in your notes. 
Whitman loved to use the word poets, not as just somebody who writes poetry, but rather artists in general. This is a very inclusive term. Put that in your notes. And notice it's poets to come, and then notice it's an exclamation mark. Notice the poem line has an exclamation point, not the title. Poets to come, exclamation point. Notice we've got several of these at the end of this line. We'll have another one, right? In other words, there's a sense of urgency in this poem. Notice he talks about orators. We've already mentioned in earlier lectures that Whitman believed that his poetry should be read aloud. Can you imagine living at the same time as Ralph Waldo Emerson and getting to hear him provide those amazing lectures that ultimately became those essays that we've given lectures for and at LearnStrong.net? Singers, obviously, we've mentioned it. Musicians to come. Again, this use of the word come. I want you to follow the use of this word. I, just to remind, at the very beginning of a Leaves of Grass, in that epigraph there, there is the very first word of Leaves of Grass in the deathbed edition is the word come. It's an invitation, isn't it? It's an invitation to say, follow me, come with me, go with me. And we'll see this, obviously, in our study of Song of the Open Road, a foot and lighthearted I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me. But he's inviting you, obviously, to come with him. Then he says it, not today is to justify me. Now, this notion of justifying and answering we're going to get in this line, this is such an important part of Whitman thinking about his book, as he will call it in other poems, right? Not today is to justify me and answer what I am for. That is to say, the value of my life, the value of my book of poems, Leaves of Grass. But, he says, you, speaking directly to the reader, the poets to come. We're going to see this again and again. This will become so remarkable, the way he'll say things like, hey, what's it like to hold me in your hands? And you kind of go, whoa, what are you talking about, dude? I'm just reading a poem you wrote. He sees it in very intimate ways, and he's speaking directly to you. I like to think about this poem being directly given to you guys as students. But you, and what does he say about you guys? A new brood. He knew that the new was the new, right? The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. He knew the new brood, native, that is to say, American, fully American, born and bred. He'll talk about it in Song of, uh, of Myself. Here in this country, native, athletic, he loves this word, dynamic, urgent, Continental will give some sense of European. So notice this distinction between native and continental. Greater than before known. This idea that America is the greatest experiment. And he always saw it as that. Yet there did seem to be a bit of anxiety about that at times. Like, um, will America prove its greatness? He, he certainly believes that that will only happen in the poets, in the artists to come. And then arouse with the exclamation point in the next line. And again, this idea of wake up. This will take us to our Thoreau and obviously our Walden. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us in our sound of sleep. That's the awakening that he is arousing, that he is that he's suggesting. For you must, and there we're back to the word again, and we'll hear it one more time with this notion of prove. You must justify me. In other words, I won't know, he says, whether I've done my job or not for hundreds of years into the future when the poets to come will justify my project. I'm sometimes asked, how do you know if your teaching works with students? And I will often say, can't know it until they're 30 because it takes a long time to actually live a life and to come to terms with what it means to live a life. By three decades, we hope that you guys start to figure it out. Notice he's not looking three decades, he's looking three centuries into the future. And I think our very giving of this series of talks suggests that maybe Whitman knew what he was on to as he is inviting you guys, and of course many artists to come, to get on board with him, to justify his work. And then we have the anaphoria of the repetition of the word I three times in the lines to follow, but notice the juxtaposition here of the next two lines that sit out as somehow separate, right? I myself, we're going to hear more about this in Song of Myself, but write two, one or two indicative words for the future. I but advance a moment only to wheel 
and hurry back to in the darkness. We can't think about that line without thinking, of course, the darkness of Heart of Darkness, Conrad's classic that we've lectured on. Notice he says, I only really speak a few words, and then I wheel and hurry back into the darkness. I'm not going to be here for long. In other words, we all only swing at the park for a short period of time, and the van has always been waiting from the moment they took us to that park. Might not want to go to the van. Got to go to the van, as we have said many times. He says it, I, he says, am a man who, comma, sauntering along without fully stopping, comma. Now, this sauntering is the word loitering, it's the word loafing, it's the walking, it's the trekking, it's the journey that he will constantly be talking about. It's, it's one of the most important metaphors. And, of course, leaves of grass. Think about the word leaves. And now see it as a verb, as in he leaves as in he goes. And here sauntering is his, is his word of choice. It's such a great word. Without fully stopping, turns, he says, I'm the man who turns a casual, I, I said glance, here's look, but it's a glance, it's a look, casual, upon you, and then averts his face. In other words, you and I can make eye contact only for a brief moment in time, and then I've got to go bye-bye. He'll say it later at the conclusion of Song of Myself, I'm the guy in the dirt, under your boot sole, which is one of those really remarkable ideas and lines, right? He then says it, leaving, there's your leaves of grass, right? Leaving it to you to prove and define it. Now, obviously, it here is the mission. It's the goal. It's the book. It's the collection of poetry. It's the fancy, as he will reference it at the very end of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. Expecting the main things from you, right? It's all about expectation. And in fact, I want to argue this is the way to read Leaves of Grass. And this is why I will argue that you want to read all the poems of Leaves of Grass, not just a few of the anthologized. I mentioned this one is a majorly anthologized poem, no question. But notice the Tiresias-like voice here as he's speaking to the Odyssean journeyer that's about to, the poet, the artist that's about to come in the generations to follow. I'm going to leave it to you. I expect you to do something really remarkable. And I'm hoping that you will use my book of poems as a way to do that. Well, let's finish it 2A. Obviously, the young have to finish with the old start. I mean, that's one of those themes that we see uh, encouraged in so many texts we study. Obviously, we're all connected through art, and the role of artists is for us sacred. It's precious. And in 303, that's why we always say we're the stories we tell and retell, the stories we accept, and, of course, the stories we reject. At 2B, notice, of course, the three-part kind of division of stanzas. This we're going to see going forward in the way that Whitman will play games with stanza creation. Important. The anaphoria of the three eyes I've mentioned. Again, pointing out as well the three exclamation marks, the energy that's a part of that. And notice how he will use the exclamation points going forward. At 3A, there's so many ways we can relate this. I just want to pause for a moment and remind us, as we've mentioned it already, though, of, uh, of, of the idea in the Odyssey with Tiresias, and then the continuation of that idea with Tennyson's Ulysses, a poem that Whitman loved. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, the old man Ulysses, Odysseus will say, as he's getting ready to take his last journey, to whom I what? Leave the scepter in the isle. He works his work, I mine, he'll say a few lines later. In other words, the old have to hand over to the young. I also want to point out that T.S. Eliot's little getting, and especially that part two where we have that exchange with that phantom or that ghost, as I've talked about it in, uh, at LearnStrong.net in those other lectures that I've given on four quartets. Notice we're playing the same kind of game, and this takes us back to our Dante and our Virgil. Virgil, of course, the classic poet, Dante saying, I'm the poet that followed you in your tradition, and you speak to me, Dante the poet will say, so that at the moment that he's most fatigued in Inferno 2-4, it is for Virgil to say, up on your feet, this is no time to tire, I expect more from you, there's a higher, a longer ladder yet to climb and all of that. Now, of course, we can go back to other poems, Shut Not Your Doors, that quest for validation, and again, as we said, Whitman as, as prophet, and then that prophetic voice of the Tiresian voice, we're going to see this regularly in Leaves of Grass. Finally, at 3B, what was a time that you had to finish something 
that an older person began, right? Think about what we're, uh, we're going to see in Song of Myself in passage 46, 47. He most honors my style, the speaker, the teacher, the pedagogue, Whitman. He most honors my style and learns under to destroy the teacher. The job of the student is to go beyond the teacher. If I'm a teacher at all, my goal is to make you somehow transcendent to me, destroying me, not needing me, moving beyond me. And Whitman will argue he wants you to move beyond his book of poems, his leaves of grass, and he challenges us to do that. How about this one? How or when have you, right, been in some ways justified, right, in an older person's hopes for you, in parents, grandparents, a teacher, and you lived through their expectations and beyond their expectations, and that somehow made you an even greater student, an even greater person. And of course, those individuals in our lives, we live in celebration of them. And if they're still alive, obviously we want to seek them out and say to them, thank you for challenging me to be a poet to come. Welcome back and we'll finish with the final two remarkable little poems of the inscriptions chapter. Thank you.